So, hi everyone, uh, and welcome to the Regression of People with Down syndrome Dream Conference. My name is Madeline Smith, and I work on behalf of the Cambridge University as a clinical research assistant. And I'd like to thank you all on behalf of everyone here. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. So, first of all, what I'd like to do is just go through the agenda with you all, just so we have a bit of an understanding of what will be happening today. So we will have um, Carol Boyce, who's the Chief Executor of the Down Syndrome Association, who will be speaking first. And then our second speaker will be Dr. Stephanie Santoro. And after this, we will have around 20 minutes for a bit of question time around any questions you may have about the presentation and any additional questions as well. And then after that, we'll go for a break for 10 minutes just to get a cup of tea and things. Um, and then we'll have uh, welcome back at 1.15, just in case there's any difficulties joining back in or sort of getting everything ready again. And then after this, we will have our second speaker, which is Dr. Jonathan Santoro. He will be speaking and presenting to us today. Uh, and again, we'll have another question time again for that. We will then have a second break of 20 minutes, just to have a bit of time again to just go and have, have a bit of a break. And then after this, we will have some experiences. So we have the three lovely volunteers who have agreed to talk about their experience with regression today. And they will have that time just to discuss all of their different experiences, the impact it's had with them. And then we will have Dr. Shubhid Zaman, who will be our speaker, who will be introducing sort of the upcoming research and sort of discussing there what is the latest thing that we've got going on at the university as well. After this, we will have a little bit of a break where we will just ask you to leave the meeting and rejoin again. And this is an optional extra, so um, it's oh, where we have sorry, to... sorry to interrupt you, um, Madeline, but we're what? having some requests to say, can you speak louder, please? The... Oh, I'm so sorry. Can, no, can, okay. can you hear me now? That's better. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, so we will be doing the experience, people's experiences, and we have three volunteers for that. And then we have our third speaker, which is Dr. Shahid Zartman, who will be talking about our latest research and upcoming research that we are doing at the University of Cambridge. Um, and then finally, we will have a, a breakout room discussion, which will be discussed a bit more in detail later on, as it will require sort of a bit of a change in the, in the meeting formatting. Um, but this will be where we give you the chance to talk to other people and share your experiences and understanding and sort of have that ch chance to talk to different people about what, what has happened for yourselves as well. And then coming together finally at the end to discuss your feedback, your response and all of those understandings as well. Anything you'd like for us from us in the future as well. Okay. So, um, firstly then, I would like to introduce the Chief Executive of the Down Syndrome Association, uh, Carol Boyce. Thank you, Maddie. And hello, everybody. Um, we're delighted to be able to co-host this webinar today on such an important topic. We know from inquiries that we receive from people who have Down Syndrome and their families, that there is real concern about this particular condition. And so much so that we contacted the team at Cambridge because we were really concerned about it and we felt that we needed to try and do something to find out more about regression. And we were, del we're delighted to say that the team said yes. And we're currently funding Maggie's work at the moment, and I hope we'll be able to do that um, for some time to come. It's not the first time that the DSA has funded the work of the team at Cambridge. Um, we certainly, I think we're into double figures now in terms of the projects that we've done with this brilliant team. And um, again, I hope we will be continuing that funding for some time to come. The DSA is a relatively small charity, but we do support and sometimes fund research, in fact, quite a lot of research. 
We also work very closely with the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group of UK and Ireland. And I'm pleased to say that we have members of that group on the webinar today. So we have some great speakers. Um, I'm sure that um, you'll find this webinar extremely informative and extremely useful. And I'm now gonna hand you over to Dr. Shahid Zaman from the Cambridge team, who is going to take you through um, what's gonna be happening today and talk a little bit about the speakers. So over to you, Shahid. Thank you, um, thank you, Carol. There's a few problems with the internet. I don't know if you experienced them on your end, but anyway, I'm assuming everything is being transmitted uh, uh, correctly. It's great to see lots of people from all over the world. I've seen a few from uh, one from Australia saying hi. That's that's fantastic, and I, I believe there's some from the US as well. I'm sure other and Germany as well. I've seen that. So that's fantastic, and London, of course. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this uh, um, this um, afternoon. Um, so I think what, what we'll do is uh, I am I'm the um, head of the Cambridge Intellectual Disability Research Group in Cambridge University. I'm a psychiatrist by background, and I've been working uh, in the field of Down syndrome for over 10 to 15 years, um, and we're, we're very interested in, in this area. We, you know, like Carol was saying, it's, it's it's something that we really need to explore because there's lots of um, problems that people face uh, in, and we need to sort of try and get some solutions as soon as possible. So before, uh, I, I think we might as well just get started uh, uh, with the Stephanie, Dr. Stephanie Santoro is, is uh, away, waiting. Uh, is she waiting? I'm just going to introduce her in a minute if she's there. I think there's a few technical difficulties uh, with joining. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, so I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce her anyway, and it, and it gives me the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephanie Santoro. Um, she has, she's a pediatrician who trained in clinical ge genetics, and she's devoted a career to the health of individuals, genetic syndrome, and Down syndrome is her primary genetic syndrome of focus and area of clinical expertise to which she is passionately dedicated. She's a director of quality improvement research at the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, Down Syndrome Program. Um, and within the field of Down Syndrome, uh, she has specialized in quality improvement approaches and increasing adherence to guidelines for medical care. She's a graduate of, uh, hi Stephanie, I've just started your introduction. I knew you were coming. Again, thanks for coming. Um, uh, she's a graduate of uh, University of Cincinnati, and uh, where uh, she completed her residency at the Children's Hospital there, uh, Medical Center. She's currently an assistant professor in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, and she served on the health advisory board of the medical and scientific advisory committee of the Mass Massachusetts Down Syndrome Congress, the board of directors of the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group, which is obviously very relevant to our topic, and the executive uh, committee of the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics Council of Genetics. So this is um, this is great. Thank you so much for joining us, Stephanie. I think we've got some really stellar people on this topic. Uh, you've done a lot of work in this area. Um, so I'll hand it over to you. Uh, you'll have to, I think you know what to do, share the screen and thank you for that. Oh, great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm excited to be speaking with you guys today about regression and Down syndrome. Uh, are my slides showing okay for everyone? Just let me know if not. Um, yes, we can hear you and, and we can see the slides. Thank you. Great, great. Um, yeah, so this is a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart. I, um, as a, a young uh, kind of intern resident, um, I saw a few patients with this. And when I went to a Down syndrome meeting, I, um, I saw a presentation on this and it really sparked my interest. And um, I'll be talking about kind of my experience and 
research we've done in this area over the past few years. Um, I'm a geneticist by training, as um, as mentioned. So a lot of a lot of what I do is more the research side, um, but I'll kind of go through that during during some of the discussion. Um, so I don't have any disclosures to a report related to the presentation I'll give today. Um, as mentioned, I do volunteer and I do get uh, research funding um, from the NIH and from a research um, group here in the U.S. Um, so basically, I'll be talking about kind of the research we've done on the phenotype of Down syndrome regression. Um, I'll talk about some diagnosis um, research we've done, some management research, and I'll really just kind of uh, talk about kind of what it looks like and and that side. I know later today you'll have um, uh, a colleague, Dr. John Santoro, um, who's no relation to me, but he's a, a real leader in this field, and he'll be talking about um, management much more and some of his kind of emerging research about that. So, um, so when I think of regression, you know, to to different people, it could mean a different, you know, many different things. It could just mean a change. It could mean a loss of skills. Um, some families talk about regression in terms of like a summer slide, or uh, we saw this during the COVID pandemic as well, where children aren't getting as, as much um, education or maybe as much therapy. And so some of their academic skills kind of slide back in the summer. Um, Regression could be a component of autism spectrum disorder. People could see it with Alzheimer's disease. And it really could be due to a lot of other things when you just think of the word regression overall. Um, but that's not the type of regression I'll be talking about today. I'll be talking about a very specific type of regression um, that we're seeing in people with Down syndrome. And when we look in the literature, uh, we can find cases back to the 1940s of this uh, regression in Down syndrome. They called it catatonic psychosis uh, back then in the 1940s. But when I started doing this research, I really wanted to try to get an idea of how many cases are out there, how many cases have been published in the uh, medical literature. And these are some of the articles I found um, that described patients with Down syndrome who had the kind of regression that I'll be talking about. Um, and you can see it's been called a number of different things over the years. Down syndrome disintegrative disorder is another common one. Um, some people just call it regression. Some people call it anatonia. And I'll talk about this a bit during the uh, presentation, but I think there is probably kind of a range or a spectrum um, where there may be overlap amongst these things rather than it being distinctly one or the other. Um, but, you know, we're still doing a lot of research in this area. So the answer to that um, probably is still truly to be defined. But um, these are the number of cases I could find uh, over the past, you know, published literature. And so overall, when we started doing um, a lot of this research, there were only around 80 published cases that I could find in the medical literature. And you can also see in the table um, the age of onset for these patients who had Down syndrome and regression. And most of them were experiencing these symptoms kind of in the late teens, um, some early earlier in childhood, some a little bit later into adulthood. Um, but the age range, I think, is um, um, an important um, thing to keep in mind. So um, I mentioned going to kind of a conference years ago, and it was this conference, the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group Conference. And within the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group um, in, in the U.S., there's a regression work group, and it's led by these doctors, Dr. George Capone and Dr. Brian Chicoin. Um, and the regression work group really started kind of describing the cases they were seeing. So these were, um, you know, clinicians right on the front line seeing patients with Down syndrome who were having this loss of skills. And they came up with kind of core features and common features that they were noticing that were consistent amongst their patients. And so um, I'll talk about these a lot, but the kind of three like core feature categories are adaptive function, cognitive executive function, and motor control. 
And then the common features relate to behavior and mental health. So um, our International Down Syndrome group started kind of collecting cases uh, beginning in April 2017. And we um, originally really kind of aired on the side of being inclusive. So we started by including lots of cases that um, we thought fit regression. And we really presented almost all of the cases at the beginning where uh, we have monthly phone calls, people would join the calls, um, the sites who are part of our research, they would present the cases of the patients they were seeing and describe the clinical symptoms. And others on the call would kind of weigh in to see if um, they agreed that it was regression, or sometimes they might suggest other medical workup to do to exclude co-occurring conditions. And then in this, um, in this research project, we did exclude regression if it was caused by another known diagnosis. Most often that was autism, spectrum disorder, or Alzheimer's disease. So we didn't include those in this um, case series, but really, you know, patients with autism and um, Alzheimer's could have regression too. So it doesn't mean they don't have it. It's just not the type of regression we were focused on. So when we did this research, we collected demographic information and clinical information. And for the first part of this um, project that I'll be talking about now, we used um, data from six different sites. And you can see kind of the sites are each of these spokes on the little wheel. And the way it works with our international group is we choose topics every year, or every other year. Um, like I mentioned, we meet on monthly phone calls. Each um, clinic, each site really collects, maintains, and controls all of its own data, and then submits and maintains all of its um, regulatory documents through their own um, IRB board. And then we all use the same kind of minimal data set, and we collect data using the same REDCap registry software. So um, after a certain collection period, usually a year or two, like I said, um, all the sites will collect their de-identified health information and kind of share it together to the core statistician. Depending on what project it is, the core statistician could really be at any of these sites. So um, Dr. Brian Scott co-leads this whole um, consortium, but for the regression work, um, I took the lead on summarizing the data, writing up the paper, you know, all of that. And so our site was the core statistician for all the regression work that I'll talk about. Um, and we've, we've published um, an, on a number of topics to date, um, just describing our consortium. Um, we've looked at iron deficiency, thyroid function, and celiac disease. Um, and I always mention when I'm giving a talk, if there are any sites in the audience that are interested in doing research or want to join us, we're always looking for more members. And I can help connect you and, you know, get all of your um, kind of regulatory documents started and um, work on that with you. If anyone has an interest, just let me know. So on the regression piece where we were describing the clinical features, these were the demographic um, characteristics. In addition to collecting information on patients with regression, we also collected on patient um, information on patients with Down syndrome and no regression. So those were our controls. And um, overall, you can see that the demographics were pretty well matched between the patients with Down syndrome and regression and the um, patients with Down syndrome without regression. And of these uh, 35 patients with regression, 11 of them um, had a negative medical um, workup, like a fully negative medical workup. And I'll go through all of this a little bit more as I kind of walk through the data with you. So I mentioned kind of the core features and the common features. So we'll go through each of these. For all of these bar charts, blue are the patients who had regression and orange are the controls with Down syndrome without regression. So you kind of get a flavor and a sense of what regression looks like as, as we walk through these. So on the core feature of adaptive function, um, some of the, the common things that we see in patients with regression are um, changes in social skills, so more withdrawal, avoidance, isolation, 
um, spending time alone. And for all of these, it had to have an onset of three months or greater. Um, and then other features are things like changes in their functional ADLs or changes in their speech with kind of um, softer um, or less speech. Another core feature is cognitive executive function, and the features on this um, in this area are changes in attention, and you can see kind of the description of that, changes in their functional skills, um, getting lost, confused, or disorganized, um, procedural memory. This is one that I really uh, noticed or really jumped out to me. These are patients who previously could you know, do tasks in their life, like um, taking a shower, taking a bath, and now they would kind of almost forget how to do that. People would describe that they would walk to the shower, the water's running, they're ready to get in and take a shower, but they just kind of freeze and stand there and aren't quite sure what to do next. Um, so that was a, um, a feature that we saw fairly often. Um, and then for all of these, of course, on the on the top are the number of patients who had this of the 35. So 30 of the 35 had that one. Changes in learning memory, um, changes in planning and organizing, um, and changes in declarative memory. So for all of this, you know, at different times, people would suggest, could this be um, Alzheimer's disease at just a very young age? And it really seemed different and unique to us um, and not Alzheimer's disease at, at um, you know, teens and 20s. Um, <clears throat> and then another core feature are changes in motor control. Um, so you can see kind of some of the descriptions here, changes in initiation, motivation, mutism, um, stereotype movements, patatonia, again, um, thinking of kind of the spectrum, only 19 of our 35 um, had catatonia listed. Um, and, you know, you might debate if if they had catatonia and we just didn't um, detect it or if we didn't, detect, you know, detect it at the right time. But um, I think that is one piece that makes me suspicious. Maybe there's kind of a range with some people having more features of catatonia and some who don't have that. And then um, also extra pyramidal movements like um, freezing, rigidity, tremors. And then on the common features, um, these are changes in behavior. So externalizing behavior. This one we also saw in some of our controls. So this one wasn't um, statistically significant, but internalizing as well. Again, just kind of that withdrawn, not wanting to be around people. Um, that one was more common in our patients with regression. So overall, when we looked at the diagnostic features I've talked about so far, they all differed substantially between the patients with regression and the uh, match controls for everything except for the externalizing behavior that I mentioned. So we felt pretty strongly that this kind of um, well supported the clinical definition that that Down syndrome medical interest group work group had um, developed so long ago. Um, and then on the common feature of mental health, you can kind of see some of the features here. And when we looked at these, um, overall patients with regression had four times as many mental health concerns. Um, and this was driven mostly by kind of issues related to mood, sleep, appetite, incontinence, and transitions. And again, for all of these, it had to be present um, three months or greater. And so overall, when we compared our, the score for each of these five categories between our patients with regression and the controls without, we saw a pretty clear difference. And we felt like this, again, really supported that proposed definition that the clinicians had developed. Our group has also developed a tiered medical workup, um, and this was developed kind of um, further back, the, the, more, the longer I give these presentations, but back in 2016, so it's been a little while. Um, but at the time, these were the evaluations that we were looking for 
to kind of rule out any co-occurring conditions that could either look like regression or could contribute to it. And you can see the evaluation and then the diagnosis that we'd be looking for here. And as you look at them, you know, we start with pretty common things like looking for thyroid conditions, um, checking hearing, checking vision. But then as you kind of go through the tiers, you get to more rare things. Um, and even as you kind of work down, you get to more advanced genetic testing, um, looking at genes that could go along with, um, with regression. So some of our patients, we've done these tiers each year they come back. Um, and I can kind of go through this on the next slide uh, about the results and what we found. So when we did this tiered approach um, in these columns, you can see the first is our patients with the regression and, and Down syndrome, and this is our um, patients with Down syndrome and no regression. And um, you can see overall the tiered evaluation, you know, it, it didn't... Um, have a very high rate of finding abnormalities. Um, these are the percent that are abnormal for each test. Um, but the, the place we were more likely to find abnormalities were on uh, vitamin D levels, sleep studies, um, thyroid antibodies, and celiac screens. Um, so for some of our patients, we did find little, little things with their medical workup that we tweaked or improved. Um, and of the of these patients, I wouldn't say that we found one really clear medical explanation that seemed to be the main answer. You know, these were little things we could improve, but not like a, a clear um, explanation for the regression. Um, and as I was walking through, I mentioned that some of the patients had additional genetic testing of our patients with regression who had genetic testing, um, some of them had like gene sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and of those, all of them have actually returned normal. I don't think we've ever found a genetic indication um, or explanation among our patients with Down syndrome and regression. Um, and again, it's not all, it's only uh, probably a handful, but they've all been negative so far. So I'm really curious to see as more um, people do additional genetic testing, if we'll find any like, um, you know, causal genes or, you know, genes that contribute um, in the setting of trisomy 21 that kind of explain what's going on with regression. Um, and when we looked at um, an analysis of kind of the subset of patients who had a negative workup, um, or we, we use the term non-diagnostic, um, this really still reinforced the proposed definition. All of those scores still held up and really were um, substantially different between controls and regression. Tiered workup also includes a screen for stressors. Um, and this includes stressors that were present six months prior to the onset of decline. And when you look at the controls versus the cases with regression, you can see, you know, immediately that there are uh, different types. So the controls have, you know, additional colors um, that they were experiencing um, that the controls were not. And when we looked um, overall, at our 35 patients with regression, 25 of them had at least one stressor, again, um, present six months prior to the decline. And overall, regression cases also endorsed around six times as many stressors. And this was di driven by um, higher prevalence of things like changes in school or workshop employment, loss of a family member, friend, um, or caregiver because of a move. Um, and so we've wondered if stressors somehow kind of precede the regression, maybe in combination with, you know, an underlying genetic risk factor or something else, um, you know, in the history that maybe it's multifactorial and this stressor is kind of one piece of the puzzle. Um, and then our tiered medical workup also includes a screen for depression. This one's also focused on the six months prior to the onset of decline. 
And you can see, you know, there, there are many more symptoms of depression in the blue regression cases compared to controls. And 28 of the 35 had at least one symptom of depression. And overall, the regression cases had seven times as many depressive symptoms as controls. And some of the symptoms were um, insomnia, poor concentration, poor memory, loss of interest, social withdrawal, and wanting to be alone. So also this one seemed to differ. And it's, it's um, hard to say if the stressor leads to these symptoms of depression or how it's all related. But um, these were kind of interesting findings that we came away with from our research. So in summary, from that part of the um, research, we felt that the clinical diagnosis was really well supported. Um, we found that mental health um, was higher in cases with regression than with controls. But when we looked at the, the features, you could see the numbers for each of the core and common features. Not all of the patients um, with regression had all of those symptoms. So no single feature seemed to really capture all of the cases and only the cases because occasionally some of the symptoms were also present in controls. Um, and when we looked at the medical evaluation, um, our stressor screen was positive around 67% uh, of the time and the depression screen was positive around 97% of the time. Um, but again, no single evaluation in the, in the medical workup or the stressor and depression screen um, kind of identified the regression cases and only the regression cases because again, um, not all 35 had had any of those where none of the controls did, if that makes sense. Um, so overall, we 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 got some good hints and ideas, but we didn't feel that we had kind of come away with a clear etiology, um, and that still kind of remains to be um, determined. And maybe you'll hear a little bit more from Dr. John Santoro on the etiology piece later. I wanted to mention that in our supplemental material, we have a 28 item checklist. Um, this was published back in 2020. Um, John has done additional work since then to develop kind of a consensus criteria. So um, I think either are okay to use. And if you wanted to look at this one, it really is a simple like present absent checklist and we propose these different scoring criteria for clinicians who might encounter patients with Down syndrome and regression in their practice. Um, and lastly, before I start talking about the management piece, um, I wanted to just share this link with you. Um, it's a video of a person with Down syndrome who had this regression. Um, it was put together by her mother who happens to be a physician. And um, I think it just really, um, you know, it, it shows it much more than I could with words. And I think it's a, a great um, video if, if anyone has patients like this um, and they're wondering or want to just see kind of um, firsthand the changes that can occur and what it looks like. So um, I, I can share that in the chat, um, but I think it's a great video if, if you have time to take a glance. So next, uh, in the remaining time, I'll quickly kind of talk about different types of management. Um, so for patients with regression um, or Down syndrome disintegrative disorder, catatonia, I'll kind of use all of those interchangeably um, with regression. They've, there have been different types of management that have been tried, things like um, treating the medical co-occurring conditions, um, medications, IVIG, ECT. And so this paper, uh, this is a table from a paper by Cardinale um, where they looked at different types of kind of immunotherapy and they described for their four patients the specific dosage and timing for the medications that they were given, um, including IVIG amongst other things. And this um, table is from a paper by Dr. Judy Miles where she treated patients um, with catatonia using ECT, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, and um, also trials of lorazepam. And you can see for each of her seven patients, 
um, kind of the, the different medications and um, treatments tried, as well as kind of the number of courses and, um, and how well it could return um, patients to baseline. So overall, there have been a few studies like this um, where they looked at smaller groups of patients. Um, but when we started this research, this was also kind of um, the most, uh, you know, the, the, the most published on this topic in the literature. So uh, we wanted to look at our patient's management as kind of a follow-up to our first study and continue to track people and see how they were managed over time. Um, and so we used our same model. We had another site um, join us. And so we had seven sites for this part of the project. Um, the numbers for each site you can see are the number of patients with Down syndrome regression that they had. Um, so some sites have more, some sites only have one, but um, by working together, we've been able to do this research. Um, and so for the management piece, the demographics are pretty similar to the first um, study that I spoke about. And for these, we use that 28 item checklist that I mentioned and the patients that I'll be talking about here, they had on average around 14 of these um, symptoms on the 28 item checklist. And of these um, 51 that I'll be talking about, um, 27 of them had catatonia present. So um, not all, uh, around half even. We also asked if there was a family history present um, that was pertinent to regression and four patients um, had some kind of family history that the clinician felt was pertinent. And those are listed here. Um, so things like autism, Graves disease, bipolar disorder, and depression, anxiety, substance use for one um, relative. And so when we looked at management, this is kind of how we collected our cases. So most of them were from our first publication where we continued to do research at that site. Um, for the groups that joined after this publication, some of them were able to add um, either historical cases where they could review charts or cases where they were um, continuing to follow them. So we added an, an additional 30 cases to the literature from this research. And so overall, we had 51 um, total patients who had Down syndrome and regression. Um, and we had at least some, some information about their management for these. Um, then we wanted to do an analysis comparing um, treatment at two different visits. So for some patients who only had treatment um, information at one visit, we had to exclude them. Um, but if, if they had uh, information at more than one visit, then we had 45 unique patients um, who had a total of 160 visits. And of these 45, um, seven had no improvement or resolution at any visits. 38 um, had some amount of improvement um, where even at one visit, maybe they were doing better than the time before. Um, and of these 38, then 10 of them um, were cases where they had fully resolved or returned to their baseline before this regression happened. So I'll kind of walk through our data describing the management of these 51 patients. Um, so first, and for all of these, I'll be showing both the visit number and the patient number. Um, I thought it was important just for counting purposes to get an idea of how many visits people are going to and not to overcount the same patient many, many times. So I present both pieces of information in all of these charts. Um, so of our 51 patients, um, 12 of them had some kind of medical comorbidity managed or treated. And these um, six of them were things like treating sleep apnea, hypothyroidism, hearing loss, vision, and constipation. And these seem to partially account for the change. 
And then um, three of them had remaining untreated conditions, and these were headaches, sleep apnea, and overweight obesity. Um, but none of them seemed to fully account for the change. Then um, among those 51 patients, you can see 11 of them were treated with behavioral management, and that correlated to 24 visits. Six had IVIG at 25 visits. Six had ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, at 11 visits. And 40 had pharmacologic management of some kind. And then we asked for each of these, did the um, treatment actually coincide with regression symptoms? And this is as viewed by the clinician in collaboration with the parent. And when we asked this, 11 patients who had be of the be of the 11 patients who had behavioral management, two of them did have um, did seem to coincide with improvement. Of the six patients who received IVIG, five of them seemed to have improvement that coincided with their IVIG. Six with ECT, all six it seemed to coincide with some improvement. Um, but you can see fewer visits here. So these might be patients who were getting their ECT through a neurologist or, um, or elsewhere, and then they were coming back to our Down syndrome program like once a year. Um, similarly for IVIG, some of our sites um, prescribe IVIG and some do a similar model where um, a, another um, physician like neurology, psychiatry would prescribe it. And then similarly for pharmacologic, of the 40 patients, 23 of them, it coincided with improvement. Um, and also for, for this, some sites, they might be the one prescribing the medication, or they might have their patients just come back annually to check in um, on their Down syndrome management overall. And for some of these patients with pharmacologic management, uh, I, I did most of this review, so I remember there would be times where they would be kind of adjusting doses or um, maybe trying new medications. So there might be times where they could improve and then get worse and improve and then get worse as all of that was going on. So, um, so overall, that's kind of the descriptive um, information about management um, from our 51 total patients. Then we did a statistical analysis of the one of the patients who had um, more than one visit. And so again, this is for 45 patients. And what we were doing was comparing um, the rate of improvement. So how often um, there was improvement after a visit when they were treated with um, a certain type of management. So, so this is really the the likelihood of improvement at a subsequent visit, if that makes sense. And so in this table, I'm showing the different types of management, um, the rates of improvement, and you can see they either were treated or not, and then the p-value comparing um, rates of improvement. So overall, when we looked at this data, um, we saw that IVIG management was the type of management that um, had the most significant p-value and went along with um, improvement in subsequent visits. And then I've alluded to this before, but I think it's just important to think about, you know, is regression really a spectrum? Is it a distinct disorder? Are these different terms we're all using, like different, um, parts of the same spectrum, or are they really distinct and different, um, where maybe some have more motor symptoms, some have more mental health symptoms, or is it really more of like a spectrum with overlap amongst them all? Um, and like I've, I've said, I think there's much more work to do on this front, and I think it would be great to have more measurement tools um, from diagnosis to outcomes. And um, I, yeah, I think that's an important area. But we also looked at the group 
who only had catatonia listed in, as a symptom. So again, this is about half of our group. And we looked at the management type and the rate of improvement among that group. And we didn't see any statistical differences here. Um, and it might just be that this was a smaller sample size, but you know, there's, there's um, suggestions in the literature that maybe catatonia would improve more with use of Ativan or lorazepam. And so we wanted to look at that specifically with pharmacologic management. And we didn't clearly see that, but again, it might be um, based on sample size. So more to come on this front. But um, in summary, ac across our seven clinics, we reported on 51 patients with regression who had the regression around um, age 17 on average. They showed 14 out of the 28 symptoms from our previous work. And when we looked at their longitudinal um, function, we did see that some patients um, showed improvement. And the, treat, the type of treatment um, seemed to coincide with improvement. So um, as I showed you in that kind of big chart, six of the six treated with ECT improved, five of the six treated with IVIG improved, and then two of the 11 with behavioral improved, 23 of the 40 with pharmacologic improved. And when we looked at the rate of improvement on statistical analysis, we saw that IVIG was significantly associated with a higher rate of improvement in symptoms at the next visit. Um, I've mentioned Dr. John Santoro a couple times. He and I are great collaborators. Um, he'll likely talk about some of his work looking at both the international expert consensus and um, immunotherapy later, but I think he's really a leader in the field and a, a, a wonderful clinician to have in our uh, community. So some of the next steps, we're going to continue to collect cases. Um, we're actually developing a management algorithm. Uh, all of the management data I've talked about is basically natural history uh, management data where we've just described and summarized what happened but we're hoping to come up with an algorithm that we could use in, in real time and collect data in the same way prospectively, rather than just looking back at what's already occurred. Uh, I mentioned outcome measures. I think there's really a lot of opportunity there, and we wanna continue to just work with others in the field. And I think it would be interesting to compare and contrast the regression that we're seeing in patients with Down syndrome to the uh, regression that we sometimes see in the literature for other syndromes. So this is a um, quote from this article by uh, Dr. Kohlenberg that talks about regression occurring in Williams syndrome, 22Q11 deletion syndrome, and it's also been seen in Phelan McDermott syndrome. So I've heard it's a very different type of regression. Um, so Overall, I think we still need to figure out the cause, the treatment, the naming, and then ultimately this will lead to prevention. Um, we've thought about ideas like using the stressor checklist, um, you know, uh, as a screening tool in our clinic to try to identify patients who are at higher risk to develop regression, um, but I think there's much more to come. I just wanted to acknowledge all of our sites that have done all this work. I'm just um, fortunate and lucky to be presenting on behalf of so many great people um, and acknowledging, of course, the patients and families um, and the Down syndrome work group. I just wanted to give like a one minute um, summary of our Down syndrome program. I think it's unique in the United States. Um, but we have four physicians, we have a large support team, um, we have lots of administrative support, psychology, adult therapy, psychiatry, advocacy, and a pediatric therapy team. So we see patients throughout the lifespan um, from prenatal all the way through adulthood. Um, and I think it's really nice to have that kind of long-term relationship with patients and get to know families so well. Um, we serve as a multidisciplinary clinic, so people still see their primary care, and we provide kind of Down syndrome expertise and information. 
And lastly, I wanted to mention, we do have an elective course for medical students that's through Harvard Medical School. I direct this course and we've had students from all over the US and I think we've had some international students in the past. So I just wanted to mention it if anyone um, has any interest. And I know I um, went over on my allotted time, but I'm happy to take um, time for questions in the, in the time that we have remaining. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Yeah. Really great start to, to the webinar. Stephanie, thank you for I think what we'll do now is um I think everybody's clapping you can't hear it, I'm sure. <laughs> um really great uh, introduction and you know gives a it's given us a very lots to think about and improved knowledge of people who are familiar with the condition. But there's questions I think we have. Mm. Uh, people can have uh, ask questions. So in the Q&A, pe people can put in questions um, and I can read them out if that's okay with you and then you can try and answer them. Um, it says one of them here is from Paul B. Considering the relatively low number of abnormalities picked up through the tiered investigation model, is that under review to be any more targeted? So be more specific because you're kind of doing a quite blanket thing. Yeah, that's a great question. So I mentioned, you know, how long ago we came up with that tiered workup, and I do think it has changed over time. Um, I don't think that we're getting to those lower tiers because we've just found it to be non-diagnostic for our patients. But then at the same time, we're working off of small numbers. So I don't know that there's enough data to say, oh, we don't need to do this tiered workup. So uh, kind of a bit of both. Um, and I think John may talk about this too with some of his international consensus work, um, what tiered medical evaluation should be included was part of it. So um, I, I'm happy he's done that since we started this. And um, I, I kind of follow his lead on what he's suggested. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so it's uh, it's an important question, of course, because it's the burden as well associated with all the, all these investigations. Another question from Phil now. Um, can I remind people if they could, if they are putting in questions, could they put them in the Q and A, which is separate from the chat, because otherwise I'll, I'll miss it. So the question here is: Should this screening for regression be offered? covered as part of the annual health check in the UK. So in the UK, we have annual health check with the family practitioners uh, have been tasked to do just a screen to look out for, you know, right, right. so do you think that should be included in, in, in the, the health check? Yeah, I think, I think it, again, would be a bit of a balance. So, you know, I presented 50 patients, I could find 80 published. So we don't have great information on prevalence data, you know, of uh, how prevalent uh, this regression is for Down syndrome. But, you know, from those numbers, we think it's uncommon, um, but we don't quite know. So it would be balancing, you know, do you want to screen 100 people to only pick up one or two um, versus maybe it's good to know for everyone if they're detecting these changes and skills and motor function and mood. So yeah, I think it's I think it's a, a worthwhile idea. In the US, we have guidelines from the AAP and they've they've put a statement in there simply to be on the lookout or just to be aware of it. So they don't go as far as to recommend doing like the, the 28 item checklist. Yeah. Um, if I could just add a comment or question, I mean, you suggested that um, certain stressors such as depression may preempt the condition. So um, would that be some, one of the reasons for you know, trying to uh, look for, for this? And then maybe well, the hope is that if you treat that, then you may not get the onset of regression. Yes, question. I think that's. I think that would be a great idea to to screen for either the stressors or depression or both, um, mm -hmm. because you'd want to know about those uh, beforehand, regardless of if they have regression or not, because you'd want to try to to treat them. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And also to relate it to so often the stressors are like transitions when someone can from other into going into adulthood. 
So one could anticipate that and make a journey that is safer. Okay, so next question. Uh, can you explain pharmacologic uh, management? What drugs are you talking about? So I think you did mention a list of drugs that people have tried, but maybe you want to comment on that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I did all of the like summary tables and data, and I will just say it's a bit messy. Everyone was on their own medication kind of regimen. There weren't like a clear um, a pattern that I could see. And one in our last paper, we have all the medications summarized in one of the supplements, um, especially for the 10 patients with regression who fully resolved. Um, but so people were on typically like SSRIs or um, benzos, but it could be either of those or the combination or other things. So it's, that's a bit hard to answer. Yeah. Thank you. I'm assuming the, the clinical logic would have been that uh, if it's someone who appears to have depression, you give an SSRI. Yeah. Or let's suggest citalopin or sertraline, or if it's something that looks like catatonia, you give some benzodiazepine or few reasons. Yeah, I guess that was the logic. But I've seen memantine in there, but I don't know where that comes in as a possibility. So, go to the next question. Um, please check the, oh, people ask, it says, <laughs> it says here, please check the chat. Um, so, uh, yes, I did say if you could put the questions in thing. I don't know what to do here. But let me just check the chat to give them a chance if we missed anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, um, where was the chat? Oh, here it is. Okay, so I'm kind of going backwards. Uh, were dual diagnosis ASD omitted from uh, studies? So if someone had autism as well as, uh, so prior to the onset, I think that's what the question means from Anita. Yeah, in, in our studies we did, just to be very clean about um, describing the symptoms in that first study. So we did exclude them. But I've seen it um, described in the literature where people have um, co-occurring Down syndrome and autism and then later in life have another regression. So I don't, I don't quite know what to make of that, if it's a similar regression to what we're seeing or if it's more related to autism. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Thanks. Um, so again, I'm just reading the chat because people should put it in the Q&A, but uh, it's, uh, it's asking for the way that they can get the 28 uh, checklist. I'm um, mm. some publications, is that right? Yeah, it's in the supplemental material, and the supplemental material actually is like directly available through a link. So I could e even send the link to you all if you're interested. That'd be great if you could. Yeah. Uh, if you could put it in the I'll chat. I'll share it with Maddie. Oh, yeah, or I can put it in the chat. Yep. Maddie can do it. Okay. Um, now, I'm just going again back and forth. Um, we've got a few more minutes for your questions. And thank you for staying with us. Um, so I'm going back. Um, okay, so I've got an interesting question from Mark S. Stresses are identified by events. What about measurements of stress, such so as heart rate? I think he means like uh, autonomic outputs, like wearables, or even cortisol. So people obviously have big bits and, and, and the like. Of course, so similar biomarkers that can be measured in saliva. Um, said, I haven't found anything on stress markers for regression yet. Stress is always highlighted. So yeah, that's that. a good question. I don't think I've seen that either. Anyone measuring cortisol levels or, or you know, physiologic indicators of stress? I haven't seen that either. That's a really good idea, though. People yeah. are looking, like, at the stress itself or, like, the experience, mm -hmm. but not the, yeah, not the physiologic piece. That's a great idea. So again, I'm in the Q&A. Um, Judith asks, um, she says, hi, I don't think onset seizures featured in your findings. Is there any evidence in the following uh, follow-up uh, patients with regression that are more likely than controlled? So if they have ever had any seizures prior to, um, so as a, as a kind of, I guess, either a feature or, or a stressor? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I don't think any of our patients had new onset of seizures during the time of regression, um, there may have been at least one that had seizures previously as a, you know, previous diagnosis before the onset of regression. 
Um, and some of our patients did have EEGs and MRIs, um, and those were negative. Um, those were, we didn't find anything there, but I can't comment to like the long-term experience. Of course, we know that there's uh, two phases of prevalence-wise of, of endowed with seizures, first onset, that would be earlier age, and the later one, which is where associated with onset of dementia. Timers, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going backwards now. Abigail asks, it, it's, it, and this is quite interesting, it looks like there's a big overlap between depression and aggression. Please could you explain how aggression is diagnosed or considered to be likely in comparison to depression? Yeah, I think, yeah, great question. So I think each site is a little bit different. And so, at some of the sites, um, the person who is kind of the main PI at the site is a psychiatrist. So they would be managing, um, you know, the depression um, and the regression, um, you know, front line. At our site, um, we have a psychiatrist affiliated with our program. So whenever we see patients with regression, we actually kind of try to tackle everything at once. So we typically refer to psychiatry, neurology, start the medical work up and kind of like um, really do it all at once to make sure we're trying to address it as best we can. Um, yeah. Right. I'll try to squeeze a few more questions there, although we're heading towards uh, five past, which is when we're supposed to be stopping, but I might go. Uh, use the, um, the chairman's um, exec uh, executive to go a little bit. Because there's so many great questions here. What percentage of DS community in teenage years do you think uh, develop unexplained regression? I know we discussed the lack of prevalence data. But probably, yeah, I think yeah. A rough, rough approximation. Yeah, I I would say it's hard also because over time, I, I my view has changed a bit. <laughs> when we started this research. I thought it was quite rare um, just based on what's published and what's out there. Um, but as we've started doing it, more and more people start coming out of the, the woodwork. And so I still think it's uncommon, but I, it's hard to put a number on it. I would guess maybe like less than 5%, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I think we kind of suggested uh, a way around this. Is there a Marcus that asks, is there a need for a database to record these kinds of serious events? Uh, for example, parents, parents could input information, but I think we often have difficulties with, from research point of view of the ethics, but maybe you can comment on that. Mm. Yeah, I think it's been really helpful for us to have this international um, group where we have our IRBs are more or less broad to allow us to um, include any clinical data. So most things that we do in clinic or things we collect in clinic from our progress notes and things like that, we're able to keep. And that's that's what really has allowed us to develop this database. But would be happy to chat again with anyone who's interested in joining or um, who would you know want to start a database like this. Um, where you guys are, so yeah. Um, would you mind if we go for a bit longer? Because there's so many questions. Sure. Yeah, Thank sure. You. I'm just trying to find that link for the um, sure the 28. I have it right here, so I'm almost there. Yep. Carolyn John Taylor uh, asking: Is there a nutritional supplement component to the study? Nutri Nutravene D seems prevalent in some parent groups for DSRD. Yeah, I I have to um admit I cannot recall Nutravene D. I think it is a medication, Prozac, and then supplements as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not as familiar with it, um, so I can't completely answer, but I would say if I would rely on what there's a strong evidence-based literature for. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's one from F. Nyas. Uh, patients with dual diagnosis, down and autism, how do you differentiate it if uh, if it is due to autism or Down syndrome. Um, so I guess this is a situation where someone, you know, we know Down syndrome tend to, have more, there's more autism in people with Down syndrome. Uh, I think that's the question. When you suspect regression, how do you tell them apart? Uh, or do you just look for an exacerbation of, of the symptoms of what appears to be autism? Yeah, I guess to distinguish, I would think of, 
the age, you know, the age of onset. So I, we don't typically see autism, you know, presenting in the teen years. Usually it's typically been there. And if you look back in hindsight, it's been present. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. So really, yeah, I think age of onset is a key piece. Um, yeah, and, and previous developmental history as well. And um, I, I think it sounds like you, 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 this is my question, I guess, is it sounds like it's, um, I mean, I always thought whether this is a kind of a developmental thing, because uh, you used, you know, you used them, you said you're looking at phenotypes or whether this uh, would you consider in sort of disease models as uh, an acquired condition, if you like, because we yeah. did say it could be triggered by stress. What's your views on that? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know that I can clearly say if it's more acquired or um, like congenital. Um, but I wonder if it's like a combination of things, like you have some inherent maybe family history in your background or a genetic, you know, risk factor, and then these other things occur. So I guess I would lead toward acquired, but I, I think there's still a lot to, to know. Yeah. So I think we'll do two more minutes. Uh, I know we've gone well over. Uh, from Janet, uh, the question is, how would IVIG and the intravenous immunoglobulins help? Uh, yeah. I think if it's a question of mechanisms or whether what symptoms actually improve compared with the point. I don't know which is the question here. Yeah. So for our patients with IVIG, I've only had a few of my own patients who received it, but really all of this, you know, most of the symptoms um, improved overall. And I think that goes along with it be it, you know, coinciding with the higher rate of improvement at next visit that we really do see a difference. But I've also had patients who've tried IVIG and they didn't see a difference, not included in this cohort. So um, just to mention that as well. But John Santoro will talk a lot more, I, I bet. Um, this is really his area of expertise, like the neuroimmunology piece. So he could probably share data and talk more about the mechanisms and everything. Yep. Um, I think we might have to make this the final question. It looks as if uh, about half, this is from Leo Samuel, it looks as if about half of the people were recovering from catatonia, whatever treatment was offered. I think that you showed a table. And yet yep. your data showed only a small number of people whose condition improved having received behavioral intervention. So the question, does that mean that behavioral intervention correlates with a poor outcome or can it uh, do more harm than good? And what kind of behavioral intervention would be more helpful? Yeah, I have to um, admit, I don't remember the specifics of behavioral intervention. I think some of it was um, just like general behavioral supports. Um, I would guess that when we see someone with regression, we want to you know, tackle it as strongly as possible. So um, behavioral intervention seems to perhaps like take more time and training and, um, you know, um, learning uh, to see a difference. So I'm wondering if we start with the other things first, because we really want to like go, go as, um, as strongly as we can. Not to say that behavioral intervention um, isn't helpful, but just in our group, we really didn't have that many who received that as the form of treatment. Yeah. That's great. I think we're going to have to stop here. We've gone beyond time. And uh, again, I'd like to thank you for giving us time. And it's been, I think, as you can see from the questions and interest, it's been fantastic. Yeah. So, Maddie, you could just very briefly tell us what we're doing in Cambridge, because we've, we've been, um, you know, you, you can start the, you know, in terms of addressing this problem. Um. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I hope everyone can hear me a bit better now. Um, if there are any issues, do just let me know in the comments. Um, what we're aiming to do at uh, Cambridge is to focus at regression at the regression itself, we're trying to focus on gaining a further understanding of what the symptoms are around it and trying to get a bit of a, a collective going in sort of 
getting an overall understanding of the process behind it as well. So sort of understanding people's past experiences, um, what the first symptoms were, and sort of looking at that change over time as well. Um, we are currently in ethics stage at the moment, so there's a lot of background work going on, but we are hoping to get this out very soon. Um, and we are, our, the lovely Down Syndrome Association have agreed to help us sort of uh, advertise as well. So hopefully collectively we can all sort of get a further understanding of the research, of the regression as in your own experiences, in your personal experiences within the UK as well as sort of hopefully extending it out globally as well in, in the future. That's great. And we'll we'll sort of have a bit more formal sort of um, information available uh, through the Down Syndrome Association. Um, and so you can contact Maddie and myself and then we'll try and sort of take it further. We're still in the stage of, of completing what's necessary for all sort of this sort of research is ethics. We have to go through ethical approval before we can do that. We're nearly there. So uh, once we have that, we'll be very interested in hearing from people, um, uh, just trying to understand uh, in the similar way that you heard from uh, Stephanie, what they've done uh, with collecting cases and trying to understand how, you know, what, what the issues are. Um, you know, they've done quite a lot of work already, but I think there's still more work to be done. Thank you. So I think what we'll do then in that case, so so Maddie, you want to introduce the um, the next we're skipping yeah. one um, change of slight change of plan. We're going on to the um, ex people's experiences. We've got a volunteer. Do you want to take take over? Yeah. On that? Absolutely. So um, I hope uh, it's okay with them all. Um, we have Jane uh, first, who is going to be talking about her experience um, uh, throughout her ex course of progression. And she's joining us now. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So I just go ahead, Maddie. So um, I think um, um, I'm going to tell you about my son, Andrew. Um, Andrew is uh, now 27 years old, um, and uh, he thrived. We were living abroad. We lived in Malaysia, and Andrew. Um, was thriving in mainstream school. He was um, an accomplished drummer. He loved drama. He was really into football and badminton. And then he just stopped, just stopped. Everything, um, everything, everything just stopped. He stopped eating, he stopped drinking, he stopped moving, he stopped speaking. Um, and I think if I had to describe the experience um, for him and for us in one word, it would just be traumatizing, really. He was aware um, that sort of thing, everything seemed to be slipping away from him. And he would be asking, what's the matter with my mind? And come back, come back, come back, Andrew, he, he used to say. Um, so it was obviously um, hugely worrying for him. Um, it was totally bewildering for us. Um, we we went um, sort of systematically around different medical um, professionals to sort of exclude, you know, all, all those other extra physical issues that might have been impacting on him. Um, and everything was coming out as a clean as a clean bill of, of health, really. So just nobody seemed to be able to help. Um, I think. Um, he was actually then treated finally um, for depression. It was clear to me that it wasn't just depression, um, but he was treated with metazapine, which I think is called Remeron is the brand, the US brand name. And I think that really saved his life because it, one of the side effects of metazapine is that it, it makes you eat, it increases your appetite. And he started eating, which was wonderful. Um, he, he really, um, he slowly recovered, recovered. Stephanie was talking about behavioral management. So we just um, encouraged him and encouraged him in every possible way we could. Um, I remember when he was starting to recover a little bit, he would love to walk and go outside. So we used to go for walks um, um, and, and that really seemed to help. Um, I was really, in, I am really interested in diet. So we, you know, he, he'd always had a really good diet, but we particularly looked at any, any stresses that might've been in his diet. Um, and he, he, he is much better than he was, um, but I would say he lacks that motivation. He, he, he lacks that spontaneity to join in and to do things. 
Um, so while he's come a, on a long way, I don't think what he's where he would have been at all in terms of participating and enjoying life if this hadn't happened to him. Stephanie talked about those range of stressors that definitely, definitely um, was, was so with Andrew. He'd lost, we'd lost the two grandmas within six weeks of each other several months before. So we thought we talked through that. We thought that we'd done all the things that we should have done, um, you know, to help him through that. But but months later, this happened. His elder brother had also um, left home to go to university. Um, because we were in a British school overseas, um, his four best friends had left, um, um, I think, at the end of year eight to go back to their home countries or, or career moves for their parents or whatever. So I think that whole sort of social support at school fell away. At the same time, by year nine, it's getting quite stressful in a mainstream school because people are sort of talking about GCSEs on the horizon and, and, and pushing um, um, you know, sort of pushing, pushing people to get better results and however well he were doing, um, and he was doing really well, but, he, but, you know, he, I think he felt that pressure. I also think um, at that time, his friends are sort of getting bigger, stronger, you know, people that, that would have played basketball with him in junior school, they only want to play with the good ones then, so I think all those pressures as well of, of seeing other people develop at a faster rate perhaps and, um, and, and sort of boyfriend girlfriend stuff coming in um, to conversations that he wasn't so able to be included in. Um, sorry, I think I'm, I'm gaveling this, but I think I would just say I'm so grateful that this is being looked at now to all you medical professionals because it was just just bewildering and I, I can't stress how how difficult it was a place to be um, both for for Andrew and for us as a family and all his friends and school every everything that he interacted with um, it was just it was just horrid and I'm so grateful to all of you that you're looking at it thank you thank you Jane that was very nice of you to share Andrew's story with us and it, um, it seemed to highlight some, you know, all the sort of things we've heard uh, in the first presentation. You mentioned stressors, you mentioned a particular type of medication, which is used in depression normally, which improved him. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for sharing that um, and joining us. So we'll go on to the next uh, speaker, volunteer speaker. Um, um, is it? I've got MR on your screen, so <laughs> you have to tell me, tell us, tell the audience who you. Who you. Uh, hello, it's very good to uh, be with you, and it's very encouraging to hear everything. And um, yeah, I, uh, Amara, and I wanted to talk a little bit. Maybe if you can uh, share the the screen, uh, Madi will help just some pictures. I'm talking about Felipe. Felipe was 25, was after lockdown. He's starting then, um, it was more or less October, 2020. He was um, became, become quiet. So he stopped lockdown, stopped everything. And that was very hard for him. He lost all his routines. And he then uh, became very sad and would not speak, would not smile. And he was very uh, active. And um, uh, are you manage it, Madeline? Or, okay, I I'll, I'll, I'll can share my screen quickly. Or is, maybe it's better if you do it. Yeah, uh, it's not working at all, sorry. If I share the screen again. Okay, let's see. Yeah. yeah, we we could see it, Maddie. Okay, wonderful, great. Are you are you sharing it, Maddie? I was. Let me try again for you. <laughs> <laughs> or I will do it, but I don't see the screen sharing button. So um, I'll keep talking, and you share it. So Felipe was um, a very independent and happy, and uh, would do a lot of. Um, was in drama, he was busy every day, and he was totally independent, traveling, going around, and um, was swimming, he was good in swimming, I have a picture of him, uh, he was in the Special Olympics, uh, swimming, and then um, the next one, Maddie, um, 
and he likes to get gold and silver, but when he got uh, a bronze, he would hide it and don't want it to show it. And um, he was in drama. He was uh, um, chosen to be Macbeth in, in the main role. And he, he would do everything ex excellently and traveling independent. But then we realized that he was getting lost even around uh, close to uh, um, the, ho the home and became very withdrawn, would not like to, to do anything, and lost his um, self-care. He would not be able to care for himself, was incontinent for both uh, P and Poo, and was very distressing to see him not be able to do much. And the uh, attention was um, very difficult. He would not be able to watch a film or would not be interested in touch his mobile or CTV that he likes to watch films and everything. And um, and very, very sad. Um, the next picture, please. The next three pictures you can show, Mad, please. And we would see him, doesn't matter what we would do, he was always sad. That face said that I almost would cry to see him. Uh, very sad and uh, scrubbing his hands that his knuckles would be purple purple and um, so we try we at, at first we thought ah, it is going to pass when we start to do more activities but it didn't so we uh, went for trying to find the um, this uh, disability team and it took very long for us to get a psychiatrist. They said that he needs medication two months before he would get a psychiatrist. So the GP got um, liaised with them and we got the medication, didn't work. We have to change. And uh, every time I was thinking that I was drugging him, anytime that the medication had to be, uh, the dose increased to to see if something would improve. And they improved a little bit, but not much. And then we um, also tried, asked for a psychologist and the occupational therapist, but we just got the psychologist last year in August and the uh, occupational therapist just now, three weeks ago. So he has been difficult to access the service and um, and then I, I, I realized that uh, the medication that he is on, uh, it's improving his mood and uh, dealing with anxiety, but it's not going to sort, um, to bring the skills back. Which, so we are looking for things. We went to, uh, we were in South Africa, people talked about uh, functional medicine. We had some advice on that, try some things, but uh, maybe we didn't try hard enough or long enough. Um, so, um, in Brazil now, we were in Brazil, we went to a psychiatrist there, we increased the medication, we saw much more uh, improvement, now he is engaging with playing more uh, by himself, reading his books that he never would touch the books, and um, play, uh, watching more uh, TV and YouTube on his mobile or TV, so uh, a, a more improvement, but I Think. And then thinking about uh, other options that we heard, I heard uh, seminars from Dr. Brian Shikoin and uh, about the TNI protocol, IV, IG, or ECT, and what to go. And the psychiatrist here in Glasgow, in Scotland, doesn't want uh, even to think about these other options. So it's we are searching for something that would... Uh, bring the skills back and we are still searching and uh, hoping that something would come up more. We are very glad that the research is going on, is going to start and, and we might see more things happening. But I have hope that uh, praying that Jesus that rose from the dead and is alive can bring healing also. I'm praying that his skills will be all restored and he would have even new ones. So I don't, uh, trying to do whatever we can and uh, uh, searching for the help from doctors and uh, physicians and uh, trusting God to do what nobody can do. 
thank you very much for hearing and um, it's great to be with you. Here's the picture. I didn't know that I was going to show for, to half of the world. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. That's, that's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that story again. You know, it just goes to show uh, in the chats and uh, everywhere, we're getting sort of lots of similarities coming through, some kind of pattern coming through. Okay, so over to you, Eunice. Uh, if you could share your experience with us, um, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry, already. I've just unmuted myself. I'm sorry. Um, okay, I'm Eunice. I'm mother of Isabella, who's 22 years old. And prior to Isabella um, having this regression, she was um, very articulate. She was um, working. She actually had a job in a solicitor's office. She was an independent traveler. She had lots of hobbies and she, you know, she was a great swimmer. She did lots of things, horse riding, swimming, love sports and um, socializing. And, um, and had lots of friends and a, a really great social life. And I, as a parent, actually didn't recognize some of the symptoms I have to say, because I actually thought she was actually being difficult. And I feel really bad about that because she, she can be difficult at times. And, you know, but um, anyway, it started with the isolation, isolating herself and not wanting to see anyone, didn't want to go out, didn't want to do anything. And um, and the thing that really triggered everything off was the day she ran out the house naked and um, it was so alarming, this behaviour, it just came out of nowhere and it was just so, so alarming to me. And then after and then within that week, we stopped talking, we um, all lost all our self-help skills. I mean, she was able to shower, she could cook, she could feed herself. So I'm feeding her like a baby. I'm washing her, I'm dressing her, I'm doing, you know, everything, obviously. So it was really, really so, it was just so sudden. It just happened so quickly from that time. And then we had no language at all. And then these autistic-like behaviours um, sort of um, presented themselves and there was a lot of pacing up and down pacing pacing insomnia and um, and then talking to somebody but there, there's nobody there but she's just talking to somebody and one time I actually said are you talking to somebody and it was the first time she looked at me and said yes and then went back to 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 this kind of like um, sort of catatonic state and um, and we had the speech therapist involved and she said it's beyond my help I can't I don't know what to do kind of thing here I've never seen anything like it but she agreed all those symptoms were very um, unusual so it then it became the battle to get get the help and um, it was a long journey I have to say it was a really difficult journey and so luckily for me I've worked with pediatricians before and so they were able to help me get the MRI, the blood test, the thing, because the GP didn't recognize anything. They just said I was being neurotic. And one of the things that was actually said to me was perhaps she's been sexually assaulted. That's why she's done run down the road naked. And, you know, this is a symptom. So for me, that was very distressing, obviously. So um, anyway, we finally, finally got the help. And um we're now on um, citrulline and um, I wouldn't say she's 100% because some of those autistic behaviours are still there and there is occasionally the withdrawal. So we, we don't want to sit with the family, don't want to be with the family. But I do think a contribution to that was um, lockdown, um, losing her job and also there were other losses in within the family, very close family members. So not being able to articulate that I don't know, I'm just surmising, but you know, for me, I think the loss of the job was a very big one because she loved that job. That was a whole being, and then all the things that she was doing before they sort of stopped the swimming competitions, the horse riding, everything finished. So, and I I think they are contributing factors. So I don't know, but 
the citrulline certainly that has had some improvements although it's been a lot of hit and miss so we are being monitored regularly and um i think that um yeah some of those behaviors that are still there and sometimes it's hard to get her to come back from what she's doing so and then all that self-learning she was doing before she loved history she loved you know and she was doing lots of um, online learning herself and that all that stopped and we're just starting to come back to that now so that's where we're at and i'd like to thank everybody so much particularly dr santoro for answering all my emails and reassuring me and really helping me thank you so so much great thank you for, for that and and i think it's been great to sort of get a sort of real feel for what what we're discussing here and, and as you can see in the chat people are recognizing similar stories as well and um but my my impression is that you know people want help and uh you know we know that the such a range of treatments that have been tried and if even if you get to that stage especially we're talking about the uk i think there's a lack of recognition uh, of this condition and uh, i think we need to address that somehow so welcome everybody so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jonathan Santoro, who's uh, who's a step is going to he's one of the ex leading experts, I would say, in this field. He's a pediatric neuroimmunologist, and he does he specialises in both diagnosis of, and treatment of autoimmune disorders of the brain. And his research has um, been in inflammation and how how it's involved in neurologic uh, diseases in persons with Down syndrome. He's focused on cerebrovascular disease, people may have heard of Moya Moya disease, um, and also, of course, Down syndrome regression disorder. He completed his undergraduate master's and medical degree at uh, Tulane or Tulane, I don't know how to pronounce that, University of New Orleans, nice place in Louisiana. Um, and he did his residency uh, in pediatric neurology at Stanford um, before moving on to the Neuroimmunology Fellowship at Harvard Medical School. Now, he's developed an internationally recognized research neuroimmunology research program at Children's um, Hospital in Los Angeles and the Keck School of Medicine. And uh, he's the first, um, he's opening the first clinical trial for this syndrome um, in the world this summer, which is, I think, very exciting. And I believe you will probably be talking about that as well. Over to you, John. Right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zaman, for the nice introduction. And, and thank you, everybody, for having me. It's very early in Los Angeles. That's why it's so dark around me right now. Um, but, you know, I think that even before we get started, you know, hearing these talks, uh, hearing family uh, descriptions of what has happened, this is something that we've been listening to for the past three years. Uh, we've talked to families all over the United States, the UK, Ireland, uh, European Union, and even Australia, New Zealand. Um, and it's the same story over and over again. And I think that really a lot of the research that I'll show you today and some of the developments that we've had in regression are largely based off of these stories. This is kind of what got us to where we are now. And, you know, we've had the foot on the accelerator. We want to keep it there because I feel like we're catching or playing catch up uh, in uh, diseases like regression. So with that, I'll, I'll share my screen and we can kind of get started. So that's me. That's what we're talking about. Um, and we'll start moving right through. So, I, you know, I think that this is an easy thing to, uh, to talk to this crowd about is what is regression? And we use it to just say that it's a previously or a loss of previously acquired skills. And that can be really anything that can be in activities like toileting oneself, dressing oneself, eating independently. Uh, a lot of this and a lot of the stories we were hearing earlier today are with regards to language communication loss. Um, and then loss of ability to engage with others. And I think that this is an, another really important factor that often uh, drives people to seek medical care. A key piece of this is that regression can be caused by many things. And so this is what we don't know is that we don't understand if this is a primary psychiatric disease, if this is immune disease, nutritional, whatever. And we'll go into some of that uh, very shortly. Uh, you know, a question that we get all the time is, is regression common? And, and the short answer is we don't know. We think it's relatively rare, but as many of you are probably aware, this gets diagnosed as other things all the time. It gets diagnosed as late onset 
autism. It gets diagnosis early onset Alzheimer's disease. It gets diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, and we don't really understand what the epidemiology is. At our center, uh, we see mostly uh, patients from the United States, many of whom fly in to see us. The peak number that we have right now is about 250. So still ultimately very rare amongst all individuals with Down syndrome in our area. But again, we don't really know for sure. So <clears throat> as we, we talked about, there's several causes. Our job as doctors um, and specifically as neurologists is to figure out what that medical cause is. But as many of you, you know, know, the timing of this is very important. Alzheimer's doesn't just sneak up on you. Uh, autism doesn't just suddenly come out of the woodwork. The timing of these symptoms is very important. And so when we have these acute or subacute uh, changes occurring over days or weeks, it's a really important feature uh, of this because brain function shouldn't really change that fast in a chronic disease. Um, you know, I bring up this slide. This is a, a slide of an individual with what was probably Down syndrome regression disorder in 1946. This was the original paper published by uh, Dr. Rollin on the, on the topic of a, a variety of different individuals who were institutionalized at the time because of these neuropsychiatric changes that were occurring. But I think that this just highlights, this has been something that's been reported from the 1940s, probably even before that, and we just have not really evolved our understanding of it until very recently. So I always like to review the other things that can happen in persons with Down syndrome as well. Early in life, infantile spasms, this is an epileptic disorder that is quite common, but What's interesting about it, it's also markedly responsive to steroids, uh, which are in a, another immune-based therapy. Autism spectrum disorder can be present in up to 30% of individuals with Down syndrome, but there is a phenotypic variation where the diagnosis occurs a little bit later. So it does make sense to some extent why we would diagnose individuals with regression as having this, is that if you're seeing that individual for the first time, their symptoms may actually be more reflective of autism spectrum disorder than anything else, but really that history is the important piece here. Uh, one of our specialties over here at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles is Moya Moya. This is a cerebrovascular disease. We also see that there's high rates of autoimmunity in this condition as well. Down syndrome regression disorder, we see again that individuals have this marked immunotherapy responsiveness, which we'll focus on a little bit later in this talk. And then certainly Alzheimer's disease thought to be caused by this upregulation of amyloid precursor protein, which is encoded on chromosome 21. But even that now has some data that shows that there's some inflammatory component to this as well. So the, the you know, point of putting these slides together is, you know, I, <clears throat> my training is in neuroimmunology. I have a very specific lens with which I review all of these things. But when we looked at Down syndrome regression disorder, it seemed very natural to try to squeeze it into this. Maybe this is more immune-based than anything else. I'll briefly review the symptoms. I'm, I'm sure many of you could probably recite this uh, with your eyes closed at this point, but really the things that uh, we have kind of found are, are very predictive of this condition are mental status changes that can be in the form of confusion, disorientation, inappropriate laughter, particularly in the evening hours, being off in one, one's own world or staring off, being unreactive to or non-reactive to stimuli around you. And we also see many individuals uh, increase or decrease weight. Decreasing the weight uh, or losing weight unintentionally can often be associated with severe catatonia, where you're unable to actually physically feed yourself anymore or swallow with the speed that you normally did prior. And then we see other patients who have kind of an impulse control problem and just start eating pathologically as well, gaining 30, 40 pounds uh, over a period of just a few months. We see that cognitive decline is, is, is very prominent. So this is apathy, lack of interest in doing things, or an evolution, just kind of this inability to start an activity or, or participate. We also see that memory impairment is, is pretty common and difficulty with recall, even immediate recall. And again, this can be manifested by other things that we'll talk about in a moment, but you know, these patients are, are, are not really interactive and often memory is a key piece of this. Uh, one of the early signs uh, that we find in, in many individuals is that the sleep is changing before the onset of many of the other you know, more hardcore symptoms. So we see that inability to sleep is much more common, although we do have a number of patients that have uh, hypersomnia, meaning they're sleeping over 16 hours a day. And when this insomnia sets in, we often see that there's sleep phase reversal. So people will be staying up all night and then sleeping all day or taking very long naps during the day as well. 
The developmental regression is really troubling. So these are individuals who are normally very social, very happy, and all of a sudden are just sitting in their rooms, not wanting to engage with family, friends, pets, whatever it may be. They lose these developmental milestones and, and really lose the ability to do these activities of daily living that you know individuals with Down syndrome take such pride in. Um, we also see that there's decreased eye contact, stereotypy, and rigidity around routine. So any changes to the schedule can often precipitate aggression or uh, some refusal to do things. Uh, particularly, the aggression is seen a lot more in our young male patients, especially our later teenagers. Obviously, new focal neurologic deficits need to be worked up immediately no matter what. That can be focal weakness, focal sensory changes, slurring of words, things of that nature. Um, the movement disorder is very prominent. So we see catatonia, which is that muscle stiffness. Uh, we see bradykinesia, where the movements are very slow. Freezing behavior, where patients will just get stuck while they're walking or trying to turn a corner. And gait disturbances, usually leading to the point where some individuals will just stop walking altogether. The language deficits are, are very pronounced. Um, so these can initially start as whispered speech and then the total volume uh, of the output goes down and then often patients will end up entirely mute. And we can sometimes get something called a global aphasia associated with that. Some of the individuals that um, do retain some language can also have neologisms or they start using new or garbled words that don't really make a sense in the context of the discussion. The psychiatric symptoms are, are also pretty severe. We see a lot of anxiety, delusions, some hallucinations, and this kind of depersonalization or derealization. Some of our individuals who retain the language and are able to communicate still, still will, will act as if they're in a favorite movie or favorite TV show that is dissociated from reality. Um, some individuals will start calling their parents or loved ones members of the movie or TV show that they're talking about. Um, in the US, we, we find that this is often focused around Disney movies, for instance, um, which are obviously something that they enjoy watching, but then that uh, derealization and depersonalization where they're not themselves anymore, they're actually an individual in this other alternate uh, uh, universe, basically. We see a lot of obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, obsessive compulsive disorder in a person or an individual with Down syndrome looks a little bit different. So this is not an individual who has to touch the doorknob 50 times before they leave the house. This is a lot more rigidity, routine, and really the thoughts are trapped in this loop. And so we often think of it as this uh, perseveration on very particular topics. So yes, the toys need to be arranged in a certain line, but even when they are arranged in that certain line, the individual will perseverate on the red toy in the middle and they'll go back to it and they'll keep talking about it all day and it's as if they can't break out of this loop. Uh, as I mentioned, aggression and agitation can also be seen mostly in our, our young male patients, but hypothetically anyone could experience this. So our current understanding is that um, really individuals with Down syndrome are at a risk for many different types of etiologies to regression. And so our workup is very broad. And we I use this term you know, very strictly is regression is a diagnosis of exclusion. Meaning once we've ruled out all of the other medical possibilities, this is the diagnosis to go down. Now, the reason I say that is we don't have a good biomarker for this. We don't have a blood test that's specific. We don't have imaging findings that are specific, but we do have imaging cerebrospinal fluid data that we know is more predictive of response to particular therapies later on. But again, there's not one diagnostic criteria for this uh, that is lab-based. So still, this is a clinical diagnosis, which is why it's so important to uh, rule out other causes. For instance, uh, we, we are trying to publish right now a paper on the evaluation of our first 180 patients, and 75% of them did have regression. That's ultimately what the diagnosis rendered was. But a good variety actually just had autism spectrum disorder that was not diagnosed or you know uh, was misdiagnosed. Um, but we found three individuals who were having strokes. We had um, about five individuals that had epilepsy. Um, so again, the symptoms looked similar to re regression, but when we did that very comprehensive workup, we found that there were other causes as well. How we do that is as a combination. We do blood work, we do imaging or an MRI that helps look at the anatomy of the brain. EEG is also used both to detect seizure activity, but also to see what the baseline activity of the brain is. And then the last test that we do, which, which is you know, the most invasive of the three is a lumbar puncture. The reason why the lumbar puncture is so important, now granted, 
or talking to a neuroimmunologist, this is what we do all day. But a lumbar puncture is really important because when I test things from the blood, I actually cannot tell what is going on in the brain. Your brain is protected from your body by this blood brain barrier. And it makes sense. We want it to be protected because every time we get sick with a virus, we don't get meningitis because that barrier keeps everything out. But a lumbar puncture allows us to go past that barrier and sample the fluid inside the brain so we actually, actually can tell if there is inflammation, infection, or other things that are going on in that setting. So even though it is a scary test to order for your loved one, it is possibly the highest bang for the buck um, test that we do because it gives us the most information about what is going on in the brain microenvironment. Um, I'll, I, I know many of you, again, are familiar with this, but I'll include some slides um, about individuals uh, who have symptoms that are respected of this. This was a, a card that one of our uh, patients, uh, the families had brought in for us on our first evaluation and just says, brain hurt, brain fog, call 911, which is our emergency line in the United States. Um, this is an example of catatonia. You can see that the muscles are just getting stuck in those positions and they get maintained like that. Uh, this is another example of more severe catatonia. So this individual had also lost about 40 pounds because he was unable to feed himself anymore. And he almost looks like a mannequin when you place him in that position. Can we turn around, Stephen? Let's go back to mom and dad. I'm right over here. Need to hold my head a little bit, so there we go. Come on, let's have you turn around. Real slow ability to kind of turn as well. We also see that there's ichthyotic changes on the skin. Um, so these dark patches that are suddenly developing for unclear reasons. So the, the next piece that I'll, I'll focus on here um, will be with regards to uh, the possible immune origins for this condition as well. So what we do know about immunity and Down syndrome is that it's high. So the reason why there's a lower amount of solid tumors that we see in this population is because your immune system is upregulated and the immune system actually cleans up things like cancer. Um, but what we see is that there's higher rates of leukemia, lymphoma, which are immune-based cancers because they're based off of the actual immune cells in your body. We think that this is largely due to the extra interferon that is encoded on chromosome 21, which is upregulated individuals with Down syndrome. So they get 50% of the extra dose that everybody else gets because of that extra chromosome. Now, when we think about, you know, well, what does that actually mean? Interferons are the, basically the Paul Revere's or the signal agents that start the immune system and alert it to become active. So the, the explanation that I give is that when you're studying for a test or your final exams in university, the reason why you get sick the week after that is because of interferon, is that interferon has kind of activated your immune system to become dysregulated in the setting of an environmental stressor. And because of this, this actually results in the immune dysregulation later on. Now, if you're an individual with Down syndrome, if you have upregulation of this, any stressor could potentially trigger these types of responses. Um, the, the term we use for that is interferonopathy because individuals with Down syndrome have basically an accelerated or an upregulated type one response of interferon. And obviously this slide is to just show that this affects many different immune cells, including endocrine cells and brain cells, which are called neurons as well. In addition, when we start to look at skin changes, like the ones that we were looking at, I uh, just showed you, those are also related, ichthyosis is also related to the interferon response. So when we start to look at this on a more global picture, all of these pieces start to actually overlap quite a bit. And it, it is a good explanation for maybe this is why we're seeing these symptoms. The other thing that I'll bring up, I showed you that slide that Moya Moya disease or cerebrovascular disease is upregulated in individuals with Down syndrome, 26 times more common in individuals with Down syndrome than, than the general population. If you look at other diseases that develop Moya Moya, many of them share this interferon-driven response. And I think that this is no coincidence is that these are things that are predisposing us to these very specific sets of conditions. So from our original cohort, and this is just, this has been a third of the total patients we've ever seen, 
we see that EEG, MRI, and cerebrospinal fluid are all abnormal in individual or, or abnormal in individuals up to 40% of the time when we start looking for it. And I'm just showing you two MRIs. The first one right here, you see those white dots that are in the back of the brain. Those are T2 signal abnormalities at the gray-white junction. We see that you know, now probably um, in about five to 10% of cases. And those two dark spots in the middle, this is early mineralization of the basal ganglia on a, something called a GRE sequence. This indicates, a, it potentially indicates an accelerated early mineralization in the setting of interferon-driven responses. Initially, we only reported this in about 10% of our patients. This has easily become the most common finding um, over the first 250 patients we've evaluated with this. And interestingly, when you have these abnormalities, your response to immunotherapy is about four to six times higher than it would be if you don't have these abnormalities. So again, we don't have the biomarker for the disease, but some of these actual testing components have led to our ability to kind of diagnose and then treat in a more narrow window than kind of starting much more broadly. So, you know, I think the question, and I think that this was, you know, brought up by Eunice earlier, is that is regression kind of a perfect storm? Um, accelerated in the fact that there might be a stressor, that the immune system is already primed to be dysregulated in these individuals, and that once the cascade has started, it's very difficult to be brought back in. What we also find is that individuals with Down syndrome regression disorder also have other autoimmune diseases, Hashimoto's, type one diabetes, celiac disease. So there's probably a genetic plus a environmental plus the neuropathology that are all kind of looping into one. And I think COVID-19 was an accelerant to some of this. Now, was it the cause? I don't think so. Um, when we've gone back, many individuals had symptoms of regression well before the onset of the pandemic. But I do think that it you know, is certainly a modifier for why we may be seeing such high rates of this now. Again, we've also just come up with diagnostic criteria, so we may be kind of in the boom just because now we have a name for this condition as well. Um, this is some of our more cutting edge research that I'll just show you very briefly. Um, we don't have individuals uh, who have just Down syndrome without regression that we have cerebrospinal fluid on, but what we did is we ran a very small study. It's a pilot study that looked at people with regression versus neurotypical individuals who have nothing going on. We just have spinal fluid on them. And that slide on the bottom uh, left of your screen is one that shows how homologous the proteins in the brain are together. So if there's a lot of black, that means that everybody has the same proteins. If you have a lot of red in either directions, that means that individuals with regression or individuals who don't have regression are having different proteins. And as you can see, there's a lot of red there. But that's not really satisfying. What we then did was we compared individuals with regression to individuals with known inflammatory disorders of the brain, multiple sclerosis, lupus cerebritis, autoimmune encephalitis. And you can see that there's a lot less red and a lot more black, meaning that these proteins are much more homologous in this grouping than in the regression versus you know, neurotypical individuals. And just to make sure, we see the exact same pattern in inflammatory controls versus individuals without inflammation and without Down syndrome. So again, to just kind of show you, a lot of red when we compare regression to individuals who are neurotypical. Not a lot of red when we talk about regression and inflammatory controls. And a lot of red when we look at those same inflammatory controls just against the control group. Some of those proteins are listed on the right-hand side and safe to say a lot of them are either related to immune globulin, which are proteins that protect us uh, from uh, viruses and infections, and interferon as well, which is again, kind of the root cause that we think is going on here. We talked about those therapeutic responses. Um, immunotherapy is four times more effective if you have an individual who has an abnormal EEG, MRI, or lumbar puncture. The other thing that I wanna highlight is that IVIG is 92% effective in individuals if you have one of those abnormalities versus 82% effective if you don't have those abnormalities. So even in individuals where we don't have those classic findings, we can still see a therapeutic benefit there as well. And I think that this is where, you know, when we initially started, we were very restrictive. We said, basically, unless you have cerebrospinal fluid abnormalities, 
on the lumbar puncture or an MRI abnormality, those are the only patients we're going to give immune treatments to. And that was just to keep it very narrow. We wanted to see that there was an effect because we did not know at that time. But once we treated our first you know, 20 individuals with this, we started to say, all right, well, we probably need to expand this out. And when we expanded it out, we found that IBIG maintained that effect a little bit less effective, but still very effective for the treatment of this condition. Um, the other immune therapies that I have listed on here, steroids tended to not be very effective. And the alternative or higher grade immune suppression was again, effective if you had a diagnostic abnormality, but not uniformly effective if you did not. So another important caveat. Now I'm highlighting all the immune treatments because that's what excites me. But if you look at the top end of this screen, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and benzodiazepines, as well as ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, these were had inverse odds ratios, meaning that they are much more effective if you do not have the diagnostic abnormalities. And I think that this gives us kind of a, a good guideline to say like, if you have a neurodiagnostic study abnormality, immunotherapy may be better upfront because of the higher response rate. And if you don't have them, you can always start with antidepressants, antipsychotic, benzodiazepines, or ECT, because they do seem to be effective. And if you actually look at the ECT line, the closest approximation is the EEG MRI cerebrospinal fluid normal group at 88%. So it's the highest non-immunotherapy response. And it is still quite effective. I'm not a psychiatrist, I can't really comment on it, but the problem with the ECT is that it's very difficult to wean patients off of it. And that's been kind of the major knock on using it um, historically. This is a diagram of an individual who was treated with tofacitinib. And this is one of the therapies that we're gonna be using in our trial. You can see that there's a baseline, a week 16, and then subsequent after the therapy is removed. And this is just basically drawing a line from start to finish uh, with a motorcycle and a car. And you can see how well it is done on the drug versus subsequently off the drug. The duration of the treatment remains an unknown. We, we have an article in publication right now, which will hopefully come up soon on our first 82 patients with this condition. Um, but basically we tried to wean everybody off at about a year. And what we found was that it was 50-50. 50% of patients could come off of IBI treatments and they maintained what they had gained. And the other 50% would have a relapse and they'd have the symptoms come back. And once we started them back up on it, it improved. And you can see that demonstrated here. Um, we have the 25 foot walk, which just is basically how long does it take you to walk 25 feet? The Bush Francis scale, which measures catatonia. The global, clinical global improvement scale, which is just kind of a, a subjective assessment of how things are going. So uh, lower scores are, are generally better. And then the neuropsychiatric inventory, the MPIQ, which is a really good measure because it hits many of the symptoms of regression, even though it's not specific to regression. But you see that everybody on therapy goes down pretty evenly, but then you see that there's differentiation for the responders versus non-responders afterwards. Uh, when we looked at who those non-responders were, the ones that went on to have relapsed, Again, we see that common theme of having a diagnostic abnormality, EEG, MRI, lumbar puncture, and any neurodiagnostic abnormality was the most frequently encountered in this group. When uh, individuals uh, did have recurrence, the median time was pretty short. So it was only about five weeks before the symptoms started to come back. Uh, the odds ratio, meaning the likelihood of the symptoms coming back if you had a neurodiagnostic abnormality was eight times higher in our group if, uh, if you had those present initially. And then once we restarted the therapy, recovery only took about six weeks. So it was not hard to get patients back to where they were before, but we felt that it was an important practice to look at because if we're able to get 50% off pa of patients off of a chronic IV treatment, that was a really important uh, factor for us. And we were able to do that in a good number of cases. We also had unintended benefits. I wish I could say that I was smart enough to predict these things, but we found that 34 individuals in this cohort also had improvement in their skin conditions. So eczema, psoriasis, vitiligo were all improved on IBIG. Now we know that these are autoimmune diseases, and so it doesn't shock us that a immune treatment would potentially do that. Now IBIG is not a treatment for these conditions, you know, as a first line, but it is a, a, certainly a benefit um, when we look at that. 
we also had four patients who had a history of rheumatism. So, you know, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and their joint pain improved uh, on IVIG as well. Uh, and so their pain profile was, you know, certainly benefited um, by these therapies. Not enough to keep them on them, for sure, because there are more targeted treatments for these conditions, but an interesting observation nonetheless. I'll show you a picture of one of our individuals um, who had her hair regrow quite dramatically uh, on treatment as well. We see that quite, quite consistently uh, for individuals with thinning hair or hair loss uh, during this process as well. So, you know, this is kind of the algorithm that we try to use right now um, when an individual comes in with uh, regression in the door. We, we do tend to start with some psychotropics up front, benzodiazepines, certainly if there's catatonia. And then really, if there's abnormal neurodiagnostics, we are shunting individuals to that IBIG arm relatively quickly. But I think that now with our data, we're starting to wonder, should everybody be getting immunotherapy? you know, as a first line or in conjunction with some of these antipsychotics, uh, SSRIs or benzodiazepines as well. And this is what we don't know. And this is why we're going to be running in clinical trials. So our up upcoming clinical trial is, is the first of its kind. We're very excited about it. Um, and it will be in Los Angeles and the uh, University of Colorado. Um, so I know this is a great news for individuals on the call from the UK or the EU, um, but hopefully this data will be used to actually develop algorithms um, that we can use in the future with more dedicated information in a prospective manner. Um, lorazepam is a treatment for catatonia. That's a benzodiazepine. IVIG is much of the data that I've showed you today. And then tofacitinib is a JAK inhibitor. This is a medicine that is targeted towards the type of inflammation that we think is causative in many individuals with Down syndrome. So we were talking about that interferon response related to chromosome 21. Um, this is why we're using that particular medicine. The advantage to tofacitinib, it's an oral therapy that comes as a pill or a liquid formulation. So for individuals who have difficulty getting IVs, this may be the, the best alternative in these situations. We're focusing on individuals between 8 and 30 years old, and there is no placebo group, but individuals who are treatment naive will run in for 12 weeks prior on no therapy and then be randomized to a particular arm of the study. It's a phase two study. So phase two studies only look at safety, um, but we are going to be tracking efficacy endpoints as well to enroll a possible multi-center clinical trial in the near future as well. So we're very excited about it. We, we think it's going to show some pretty positive results, but uh, you know, I, I'm, the NIH or the National Institutes of Health in the United States have really been tremendous for working with us to go from really phenotyping this disease accurately to a clinical trial in just two years, which is, you know, when we normally think about how the NHS or the NIH work, it's, you know, usually a decade of asking and begging to really get things going. But I will say to the credit of the governmental organizations who are notoriously slow to move, they've really looked at regression as a priority issue, and, and that's allowed us to develop this trial very quickly. Um, I'll show you a quick video um, of an individual um, whose family put together this clip for us. Um, and it shows kind of the before, um, during, and after in just a brief format. Hey, go away. I am now going to get to today. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready for your next smoothie? Huh? Are you? Happy Friday. Happy Friday. It's okay. This is bad. I mean, the way you can get coming in, you know what I'm saying? The way you calm down. Yes. I mean, so wet. Sweaty? So, so, so wet. Sweaty. Go take a shower.
Yeah. Can't hear you say it. Okay, Kristen, can you go take a shower? All right. So as you can see, you know, she really went from not able to doing anything, and those improvements are observed over just a period of weeks, which is really tremendous. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention all of the people who have been supporting us. We have our, our CHLA team highlighted over in blue, and then all of our other collaborators uh, as well over at Mass General, Duke, um, Colorado, Emory, UCSF, Stanford, and Virginia Mason as well. So it really has taken a lot of individuals to kind of come up with this data, start this clinical trial, but we're moving in the right direction. And, you know, uh, for our purposes, we, we have no intention of, of taking our foot off the accelerator at this time. Uh, I've included my email down there uh, for queries regarding clinical trials or for clinical questions, route it to the, the DS research line over there. But we are available and we try to get back to everybody as fast as we can. I know we're, we're not always as speedy as people want, um, but you know we're, we're willing to help. We're willing to get on the horn or on a Zoom call with any of the doctors who are interested in learning more about this condition. And I think you know certainly regression is something where um, you know, not everybody, every doctor knows about it. Not every doctor is comfortable doing the workup. And I think that this is something where once you read the data, once you talk to somebody who has evaluated a patient for this and has treated a patient for this, that's what really ends up moving the needle. And so many times I get phone calls back from physicians that we've spoken to in the United States who say, I'm not going to lie, Dr. Santoro, I thought you were a quack when you called us up initially, but the treatment is actually working. And I think that that's the, the most important thing is finding a physician that's willing to collaborate, willing, willing to learn, willing to think outside the box, box on what regression is, has been really tremendous to getting people the, the treatments that we need. The only thing I will say, so with an asterisk, everything comes with an asterisk when you're talking to a doctor. Um, I think that while I'm very excited about immunotherapy, there are still patients who do not respond to it. There are still patients that have other explanations that we don't completely understand. So ultimately, when you're making these decisions about treatment, it should be a group team effort, right? Talking to families, talking to uh, doctors, talking to the members of the medical team are really, really important. And also finding what your risk tolerance is. I mean, I have many families that say, even if I can get 25% back, I'll take it. Um, but knowing that there are risks with any of these treatments, and all of these treatments. Uh, with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions briefly. Uh, I am attending in the in the wards today in the hospital, so I have to be a little bit more brief than usual, but happy to answer questions as well. No, well, that's fantastic. I think again, a round of applause, and um, you, unfortunately you can't hear, it, hear them. I'm sure that everybody's giving it. Um, I think it's a very, I can see a very hopeful message in this. And I think that's more or less what we wanted to hear and the prospect of the, looking forward to the results of the clinical trial and you know, if there's further uh, collaborations possible, I'm sure we in the UK will be very interested as well. So, so would you be, so you said you've only got a little bit of time. Um, yeah, I've got about 15 minutes if that works for you guys. Fantastic. So we've got lots of questions. I'll, I'll look down the list. Um, okay. Uh, Paul has asked, um, considering the relatively low number of abnormalities picked up through the tiered, I think we, I think that was the previous question, so it's about the, might as well ask again, uh, about the long number of uh, assessments. He says it's, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, and I suppose that necessitates having lots of uh, different investigations. What's any comments on that? Because in the UK, we tend to be a bit, little bit more conservative with how many tests we, we want to do or can Absolutely. do. Absolutely. And, and we, are, we are understanding of that. It is a very large workup that we recommend. The, the core components uh, to highlight are that blood work tends to not really show anything. So it's been relatively low yield from that standpoint. MRI is helpful. About 25% of individuals will have those abnormalities. And again, it helps inform decision-making for immunotherapy versus not um, as a first-line treatment. Um, and then the lumbar puncture, it's a lot to coordinate, but ultimately it's not an expensive test to run. And even the testing that we do run in the United States costs us about $1,200. Um, and so in the UK, I'm imagining it's a little bit cheaper to get within the hospital systems, but we're not actually recommending any advanced testing like, you know, a PET scan or anything like that, which can 
really be where the cost adds up. But the MRI and the lumbar puncture is so important because it helps, it's the best we have right now to inform decision-making and know that there's more or less likelihood of response to an immunotherapy. And I guess given the seriousness of this condition, it's it's something that needs, needs to be done perhaps. So I'll just go backward with the question because I don't know where to start from. But Leo Samuel asks, is, I'm curious whether the IVIG, the immunoglobulin treatment, has been found to be effective for people with chronic fatigue or ME or fibromyalgia, slightly not related to Downs, but... Yeah, um, I mean, it's definitely been used in those conditions, um, both... Uh, really, I think I've only seen literature in, with, in persons without Down syndrome, but IVIG has many different indications. The reason why we started using it is because it's an immune therapy that doesn't suppress the immune system. So we wanted to just be conservative because we didn't know what the response was going to be. Ultimately, my hope is that topacitinib performs equivalent to IVIG, and then we can move patients on to an oral therapy that is a little bit more specific to their type of inflammation. Okay, thank you. And there's a question from Jude about the age. Is there an age limit? So is it appropriate for someone over 30, although it's quite rare to someone present with age, age over 30? Yeah, it, it's hard to know. I mean, I think that, you know, we set up these arbitrary time points of between 10 and 30, because if you're less than 10, the chance that you're actually being diagnosed with autism is there. If you're over 30, that's where we start to wonder about, like, is this really a, an early onset Alzheimer's disease? The short answer is we don't know. There's probably outliers in both directions, both for the disorders that flank regression and for regression itself. So they shouldn't be used as hard cutoffs. You still have to go with clinical intuition. And if you're worried, seek an evaluation. At the very worst, you can have a discussion with your doctor and see if the criteria fit. Another question from Paul, who's a, a clinician, I know him. Uh, he's wondering if he could give an overview of what the IV, the regimen is for, for treating frequency and duration for each clinic visit. So yeah. practical treatment management plan, because I think it'd be good to have that and to recommend it. Yeah, so uh, we, we are going to be publishing this in our upcoming paper. So our, our protocol isn't exactly novel. It's two grams per kilogram of IVIG separated over two days as an induction dose and then monthly dosing of one gram per kilogram thereafter. It's a very common protocol that you'll observe in neurologic literature. Okay, thanks. Um, so I've got another question. Actually, can I ask a question? The, it was interesting how the um, some of the other non-immunological treatments such as ECT, and the antidepressants work. Do you, do you think there's possibility that they have some immune effects on the immune system? Or it, it, they very well could. Now, I think that, right, like ultimately we have had the, the magic combination has been IVIG plus an SSRI. So a, a medication like Prozac, for instance. Mm -hmm. There is some synergy, but we're not really sure. Some of these medications do have a small or you know, minimal anti-inflammatory effect, but don't forget, if we look at the autoimmune encephalitis literature, which I think is the most closely resembling regression, you treat it with immunotherapy, but you also treat it with psychotropics. So while you know, I, I think that you have to have this kind of combined approach, but when we look at things like ECT, ECT does a lot of different things. And that's where I think it becomes difficult to know what is the immune effect, what is the electrophysiologic effect, what is the more psychiatric classic effect of neurotransmission? That's where I don't know. But with the, the smaller end psychotropics and oral therapies, it, we think of it as synergistic and having both is often what patients will need. Sure, um, uh, thank you. And um, a question from uh, Hilna. It's great to have the signs to look up for when a young person is regressing. Are there any prevention measures at the moment or possibly cure in quotes? Yeah. Or is this all highly uh, research-based, only currently with no medical prevention possibilities? We don't know anything about prevention right now. And again, it's, it seems to be such a rare condition that it's hard to screen for, right? If there was a blood test, we could say at 10 years old, everybody should get this blood test. And, you know, I think eventually, hopefully we will get there to have that. But for right now, there's nothing that we can necessarily do to prevent it. I think that the most important message here is time. If you start to see these symptoms, get evaluated because the median number of years it has taken a patient to get to see us is about three to four, right? And at that point, I think our efficacy of any treatment starts to go down. 
So when we've looked at our subset of individuals who are evaluated within six months of the onset of the symptoms, those are the patients that have historically done the best, fastest to respond to therapy, most likely to get almost or completely back to baseline. So I think that's a very important message to get treatment early. Um, and the, I mean, you, you mentioned biomarkers. Do you reckon there is um, uh, mileage in looking for uh, proteomically um, in, in the immun, immun, immunological profiles? Uh, or is anybody doing that? Perhaps we should be doing that. Yeah, so the, the University of Colorado has looked at blood-based proteomics and nothing seems to be coming out of it. But when we've done proteomics in the CSF, which is what I just showed you all, that seems to be coming back quite positive. But I think that this is the challenge is we need something that is easy to test for too. Doing lumbar punctures is, is very logistically challenging. So I'm hopeful that when we start to compare the CSF proteomics to the blood-based proteomics, we can find some proteins that are linked between that it seemed to be specific enough where we can start to actually develop hopefully a chip where you could do a blood drop on it and then say the likelihood of this being regression is high or low depending on the situation. And you may get a lot of in interesting information um, doing proteomics before and after treatment. Certainly. Um, might point to the pathways that are relevant. Uh, can regression occur in, from Naomi, can, can regression occur in adults over 30 or 40 years old? Probably, but I think we don't really know. And I think that the, the way that I'll explain this is that in neurotypical individuals, the immune system goes into a senescence at around 50, 60. And so we see that the rate of autoimmune disorders falls off very rapidly. Even in individuals who have autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis, they tend to become less active as they age. I think a similar process is probably happening in individuals with Down syndrome, but a more accelerated time frame. So while yes, regression certainly could happen in the 30s, certainly could even happen in the 40s, it seems like when we take all comers, the incidence of individuals having that happen in those time frames is lower. And I think it's probably related to something similar. But again, we don't really know because we're just starting to investigate these, these populations. Unless you think, of course, that um, the onset of dementia is a kind of regressive sort of uh, presentation. And, and it very well could be, but I, I think that, right, like, as, as a sign, the clinician in me and the, you know, you know, father in me says, oh, yeah, this is all has to be related. The scientist in me knows that if we don't pick them off one by one and study each thing very specifically, the risk is that the literature comes out bunk and then it sets us back as a field for, you know, a decade. And so we've, we've had to be frustratingly methodical in terms of how we approach things, but it's certainly possible that, you know, even things like Alzheimer's and even things like regression may have common roots, but we have to go very slowly to keep the literature as clean as possible so we can make heads or tails of these findings. Uh, another uh, question from uh, Ella. I don't know who to refer, refer to. I think um, I have done all the links, but Cam H, that's the, uh, UK sort of um, pediatric psychiatry, if you like. Don't know much. And adult LD learning disability services, neither. Is there a research clinic I can refer to in London? Probably not. I can answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we hope we can get somewhere. But that's. Um, we're, hope, we're hopeful that we're going to find some, uh, some you know, uh, neurology-based collaborators um, in London specifically. This year we're doing a lot, I, I call it the, the world tour of regression. So we're presenting our data at multiple different conferences um, and international conferences in the United States and elsewhere this year. So I'm hopeful that the word will continue to get out because as see, I think as soon as you, as a physician, start to hear about this condition and you start to read some of the literature, that's going to be the first, that's going to be the entry point to starting to evaluate individuals with this condition because as many of you know when you're seeking medical care sometimes the only thing that a physician or a referral center sees is the down syndrome strapped on top of the application packet and i think that that you know works to our loved ones detriment here um, but the what i keep telling people is uh, if the individual you're evaluating didn't have down syndrome what would you be doing differently and the answer is for a neurotypical individual who had these symptoms, you'd be rushing them to the emergency room. They'd be admitted to mm -hmm. hospital 
within hours. Um, and we're not doing that for individuals with Down syndrome. And, I think know, it's a very good, point, very good point. And I think, you know, even amongst physicians, doctors, it's, it's still an issue. Uh, another question from Ella. Um, I'll put that in quickly. If parents don't want antidepressants as as it as it is dumbing in quotes uh, down rather than treating in quotes, what is suggested? Yeah. So I, I wouldn't look at antidepressants as being used for depression in this situation. So the the analogy I'll give you is in the United States, if a if an individual has a stroke, we start them on antidepressants the next day not because we think that they're depressed about their stroke, but because it actually helps stimulate the neural conduction so that they can participate more in lang uh, speech language pathology assessments in speech therapy. And what we find is that individuals who start it for those reasons respond very quickly, as opposed to individuals who are being started on it for depression, which can take weeks, sometimes even months to have that effect. So in a way we're using it synergistically for very different causes, even though historically, I think we've used it to treat regression because it was thought to be depressive. So I, I would kind of reframe how you're thinking about we are, how we are using antidepressants. And that's why in my slides, I, I include verb, you know, words like SSRIs because we're using them for the effect on the serotonin system, not for the antidepressive effects really. Thanks. Uh, Kate Harris says COVID was mentioned briefly and ME, any links with Epstein-Barr or glandular fever? Yeah, and Epstein-Barr is a very hot topic in my field of neuroimmunology. We've seen that it's very much associated with the development of multiple sclerosis. We have not found any viruses um, with one exception. We have found one patient who had uh, human herpes virus number six, HHV6, in the cerebrospinal fluid. We treated them for that, it did not change. And so we started them on immunotherapy and the patient responded to that. Otherwise we've tested for EBV, varicella virus, West Nile virus, I mean, everything and have not found any particular infectious trigger. But again, even to go back to those earlier slides, whether it's a stressor or a virus or a bacteria that leads to or is temporally associated with the onset of the symptoms, I care less about what started it and I care more about what the immune response to it is now. So that in many ways, the train has already left the station. I'm not going to be treating the primary infection anymore. I'm treating what the immune response to that infection would be. Thank you. And I think we'll just make this the last one. Ellen uh, Pusey asks, are there recorded instances within the literature of a complete impairment of all receptive and expressive language skills, including reading and writing at the same time? such as global aphasia, which was listed as a symptom, or is this actually acute onset mutism specifically related to expressive language speech? I'm not sure what she means yeah. by that. And I think that this is why the diagnostic criteria are listed as they are. So we've had two or three patients who have come in and it has been ultimately selective mutism. Um, they didn't have any of the other features of regression. They didn't have the catatonia. They were still able to communicate, read, write, but only around individuals. And this was in the home and school and clinical environment. They just wouldn't speak. And ultimately we felt that that was not necessarily reflective of a diagnosis of regression, but there's not a lot of great treatments for selective mutism either. But that's why the criteria, if you look at them, are designed as possible regression and probable regression. So it allows enough flexibility for physicians to say, all right, we should initiate the workup and see if we find anything, but also has a more strict criteria for the cases where not only do we need to do the workup, but we need to treat this patient more urgently. And I think that for cases of selective mutism, you're really only meeting one criteria, uh, which is insufficient for a diagnosis. Thanks. I've got in the chat, people think we're not answering the questions. I'm only looking at the questions that come in the Q&A uh, because it, it gets very busy. So if people do want to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and I'm just scrolling down to see if there's any questions I've missed in the other bits. But if you put them in the Q&A, then I can, we can try and address them. Um, I'm just seeing where there's a new message here. So um, I think uh, I think we're. I mean, you 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 need to finish as well, don't you? 
I got, I got another five minutes for you guys. <laughs> I'm happy to turn yeah, so, um, just looking for any more questions. Uh, um, yeah, it's difficult. So if there people have any more questions, please put them in the Q&A and then we'll have to, perhaps it's a good time to, again, thank you immensely. Uh, really appreciate it. I think um, at least it's opened up, you know, people have got better understanding of this terrible uh, situation with people. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, we've developed a, you know, a document that I can uh, share and hopefully can be uh, sent out on quick, it's called Quick Facts. It's designed to engage physicians and families together. So it's written for families and mm -hmm. it's basically just kind of lists our current knowledge of what regression is. And so that can be used to just bring to the, the clinical visit right. with your primary or with your specialist or subspecialist to say, I I'm worried about this and then actually share it. And it includes references for the physicians to look through as well. And it also includes kind of talking points to kind of go through um, during your visit. Because I, I think that one of the things that we see all the time is families have this tremendous amount of information in their head. And then you get to the doctor's visit. And I think we're all guilty of this is you just forget everything all at once. And then it kind of comes out very quickly and, and disorganized. So what I do recommend is if you go in, have something like the quick facts document, have a chronology of the symptoms already typed out. So you can use that as your own personal reference. And then being familiar with the criteria can help you communicate with your doctor. Because I will say, even as a neurologist, I was not very good at picking up catatonia until I saw it in enough patients to know what it was actually looking like. And, and you know, nobody is perfect. I don't think anyone has seen enough patients with this condition to be able to diagnose it across the room. But I think that, you know, the more information, the more prepared you can be for those visits, the easier it's going to be to communicate with your doctor and have that discussion openly about why you're concerned about this and what you think needs to be done as well within the confines, you know, confines of the system as well. Okay, so um, I think I've got Nita here. Can maybe can I ask you one more question because she's the one who was, I think, saying that she can uh, get her question in. Of course, she's interested to know uh, the time duration of follow up so far after starting your treatments management, as in time periods when you say there is improvement after and how long so basically this how long this yeah this. so with there are some patients who are immediate responders to therapy like uh, even i am shocked and that takes a lot um we've had some patients where they've gone from you know sitting in a room drooling on themselves unable to be able to speak or do anything meaningful really to riding a bike within a week um, that is an exception to the rule. That's probably only about 10% of cases when we start the immunotherapy. Most patients, it will take about three to four months to actually see the effect um, of the IBIG treatments. There are a, another smaller group, probably 10 to 20% that are take even longer than that. Um, but I think that really our reference point is typically going to be at that three to four month mark, say, is the treatment working or not? And we use those assessments that I was showing you earlier, like the NPIQ and the Bush Francis and the 25 foot walk to make the assessment of, is there improvement or not? Because a lot of the time this is very subjective. And the last thing you wanna do is go into the doctor's office and be like, eh, I think it's helping about 50%, right? So we wanna have objective measures that we can say, actually the score has dropped 60% and we need to continue this therapy for, for that particular reason. Um, most of our patients have now been on treatment for about 18, to, 18 months to 24 months. Um, and we've had about 50% of them try to come off therapy at this point to see if they retain their gain. But each case is, is very unique. And right, I think that once we get the results of the clinical trial, it's gonna be profoundly informative for how we're gonna be looking at immune treatments in the future as well. And you said you had that little leaflet that we could yeah I, I can shoot you an email with that in it to share out so. okay that'd be fantastic and um we'll we'll um we'll sort of um we we can't get in the chat we can we can do we can deal with that but again i think we should finish now in the interest of time and i know there's a few questions we couldn't answer for whatever reason but again i thank you so much for all from all of us for coming and i think it's really fantastic and let you go back to your uh, usual day job if you like all right <laughs> Many but thanks, and, and you again, you, I've um, included my email in the chat as well, and like I said, Madeline, I'll, I'll uh, email you the, the quick facts document to share out with the group as well.
Thank you so much. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Dr. Shane, uh to present his uh, latest research. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to basically um, just reflect more than anything else on what we heard. Um, that's, I think it's been fantastic so far. We we've managed to uh, go through and you know, understand the the condition a little bit better. Uh, we a lot of work, great work is being done in the US, and I'm particularly excited about the fact that something is being done in terms of treatment and management. And then some of the questions every parent uh, or person who has Down's may want to know is, you know, what, what can I do about it? And I think that's this is where we need to take action here in the UK. We need to um, uh, contact the Department of Health and others to um, you know, highlight the importance of this condition, which is being under-recognized. Even though it's not very common, it's perhaps about 10% of the population uh, that may get this problem. But I think we need to, um, through education and through um, perhaps um, joining up with uh, NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, uh, which uh, recommends that or provides guidance for treatments. Um, I think that's the route we need to go down. Um, so that's my reflection. But I think the good thing is it does look positive. There are treatments that will work, um, although they they seem quite intense. Um, but I think it's I would if I was if I had that problem, I'm sure I would try. Would like to try something like that. So that's my sort of reflection on this.